Hello everyone, welcome to a new edition of, of the interview series Beyond the Cancer Diagnosis. Um, today, uh, my guest is uh, Lauren Freiself. She is a patient advocate. And uh, if uh, last in the last episode, I approached the childhood cancer, today with Lauren, we will uh, talking about adolescent and young adults or AYA. Uh, and uh, what it's to be an advocate, or what it's to be someone who really care about the uh, destiny of this vulnerable category of uh, people. Lauren, thank you very much for accepting my invitation. Yes, nice thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to talk uh, all about adolescents and young adults. Great. Um, as I usually do to my interviews, um, because uh, I'm uh, psychologist, or better said, a clinical psychologist, but our audience is from uh, all over the world, and many of our audience are patients. I uh, ask uh, every um, invitee to explain or develop uh, the field uh, in which he uh, works. So in your case, you are working with adolescents and young adults. So firstly, I would like you to um, explain in terms of age, especially in terms of average age of cancer diagnosis, uh, at what we refer when we are talking about adolescents and young adults. Yeah, so everyone uh, around the world kind of uh, has a different age set for adolescents and young adults or AYA. Um, and the most common is, uh, according to the National Cancer Institute here in the United States, is 15 to 39. So really anyone from ages 15 to 39 or under 40 um, is a great way to say that, um, is considered an adolescent and young adult cancer patient. Um, some of the most common diagnoses that we see in this age range as well is you know, breast cancer, thyroid, testicular, um, and melanoma. But we also see a large number of brain, um, cervical, colorectal is a, is a big one and growing. Um, blood cancers like leukemia and lymphoma and sarcomas are really common among this age range as well. Um, you mentioned about different types of um, cancers. Um, could I ask you to tell us what is the proportion between females and uh, males? Because uh, I would have to look that up. <laughs> I would have to look that up for you. <laughs> yeah. I know that it's common. Uh, like for obviously breast cancer, more common in women. Um, testicular, more common in men. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Um, I'd have to look that up. I'm not sure uh, around the world what that breakdown would be, but um, I could get those numbers for you. Yeah, no, uh, I've uh, asked this because um, uh, I saw statistics that uh, till 2030, um, the cancer cases in males will increase uh, extremely. Uh, and uh, I was uh, wondering maybe uh, how how is the situation regarding the young adults, especially because this is the tendency to live longer. So that means uh, uh, more we are, that we are more vulnerable to yeah. develop a type of cancer. Um, we are talk, uh, talking about uh, world and living. So how. Uh, Nowadays times are quite chaotic. I can I can say so. Um, uh, Aya, it's probably the most vulnerable uh, category in facing cancer. Uh, what are your thoughts with regard to awareness and advocacy for Aya? Yeah, yeah. I, you know, the, a lot of people still don't understand that adolescent and young adults are a special category of patient. Um, not a lot of awareness. There's growing awareness, but not as much awareness as we'd like to see that ages 15 to 39 have special needs and special issues that they're dealing with. Um, they're absolutely an underserved demographic graphic within the cancer space um, and the oncology world. And a lot of 
providers around the world, and especially here in the United States, do not specialize in this age range. So they may not understand when someone in that age range comes to their clinic, what the needs are of that patient. Um, and we can talk about advocacy in this space in two ways. So the first is, you know, patient advocacy, kind of like what I'm doing now is just bringing awareness to adolescents and young adults, the fact that we exist and we have um, specific needs. I mean, it was just in the 90s that we identified this age range as a, its own special population. Um, so it's not been that many years in the world of cancer and oncology that we've actually been able to focus on adolescents and young adults. Um, and so a lot of what I do and what a lot of advocates do is just raising awareness of the issues like we're going to talk about today um, and focusing on, pay, uh, <laughs> excuse me, focusing on awareness within, uh, you know, patient world, but also in the provider world. But we can also talk advocacy in terms of laws that protect patients. I know here in the United States, especially, we're always um, talking about local forms of advocacy, national forms of advocacy, um, when it comes to legislation and all of that around protecting patients, um, making sure that they get access to the care that they need. Um, for example, here in, the, in Michigan, um, in the United States, we are focusing on how can we protect fertility preservation for patients? How can we make sure that that's covered under insurance? Um, these are things that are also that also come to mind when it comes to advocacy in the adolescent and young adults space. So there's lots lots of ad advocacy needed, lots of communication um, needed in this space. Uh, and uh, out from this uh, uh, big uh, uh, field of advocacy, what are the key issues or facts that will spur yeah. uh, change? Because yeah. it, it is a need of change in yeah. approach the, the cancer patient. Yeah, the thing that I truly hope that the oncology world is paying close attention to is the rise in cancer incidence among this population globally, um, especially in that 30 to 39 age range, we're seeing a rise in cancers. And unfortunately, we don't have any definitive reasons as to why this is happening. There's a lot of suspected um, reasons environmentally, uh, you know, all of that, that might be why it's happened. But we need more research as to the reasons why we're seeing an increase in cancer in um, those under 40. But regardless of the issue of, um, you know, regardless of that, the issue of young adults um, is going to continue to increase. So as you said, we are we are surviving and we have long, many years to survive, right? So this issue is not going to go away. With a higher incidence, we're going to see more survivorship needs and more long-term care needs, more secondary cancers and late effects happening in the road. So I hope that we're paying attention to this rise in cancer incidence because I think it's going to just... Um, increase the number of issues that we see. We're already an underserved population. And with this number increasing of us coming out, coming on, it's going to continue to get worse if we don't um, find some strategies to handle this population in, in the future. And uh, the big risk is that uh, we as specialists, we can, we will not do what we are trained for. So we'll have to do many different things that maybe we are not specialized with. Right, So right. Uh, We agree that uh, there are some unmet needs for adolescents and uh, young adults. And you mentioned about also the laws, that means the state. So to whom you have to go to, to the message? So, or to whom, uh, who should hear this? Uh, yeah needs of yeah. Uh, Aya. Yeah, twofold. So I think it's really important that truthfully everyone in the oncology space pays attention to adolescent young adult issues. This is not going away, like we said. Um, it's going to take all hands on deck to really tackle the issues for adolescents and young adults. I also think it's really important 
as the general population, people ages 15 to 39 to understand their responsibility and paying attention to their health and getting their regular checkups. Because my concern as well here is that patients are getting diagnosed too late um, because both the patient themselves are like, oh, it can't be cancer. I'm too young for that. Um, and making assumptions about their health or afraid to go to the doctor because they don't want to know what's going on. And the other side is the provider side of it can't be cancer. They're too young for that. Right. Um, or, or missing the signs. And so we're getting a lot of late diagnoses as well. So everyone needs, everyone needs to hear this message uh, in my opinion. Um, you said, uh, uh, about the diagnosed uh, too late, for example, in uh, Romania, my country, it is a gap of two years from the first symptom to the diagnosis, not the treatment, but to the diagnosis. So two years, it's enormous. That's and then strange. there are more, maybe than one year, two years, three years till they start the treatment. So maybe in five years, uh, that patient may be not making. So uh, yeah. this is the reason that we always said that uh, oncological patients, they don't have time. They don't, uh, I, I said that they don't have space. So they just need uh, abundant and uh, confident information. Anything yeah. they, that let's say could save them uh, live longer and struggle with this uh, oncological diagnosis. Um, as any other field uh, of uh, oncology, I think also you as patient advocate have a lot of challenges. Could you name uh, at least the most important or uh, yeah. at least the general challenges yeah. you you met in your everyday activity absolutely i mean there are many there are many right but um a few that come to mind the first the very first is finding the right care team right so at least here in the united states um many adolescents and young adults end up in their local community clinics which logistically might be the best option for them. They're going to continue to go to school or go to work. And maybe that's right there in their backyard, but that is not necessarily the best place for them because the providers there may not be educated on how to support them um, in the best way. So I always encourage families um, who are experiencing an adolescent young adult um, diagnosis, I, I encourage that patient to go and seek a second opinion at a specific AYA clinic if that's available to them. So that's one of the big, the first things that happens when you get a diagnosis is, do you have the right care team around you? Um, the second, at least here in the United States, is a big deal and globally, is the financial toxicity that's attached to dealing with a cancer diagnosis. Whether that's, you know, for us here in the US, that's dealing with insurance and high out-of-pocket costs and all that. And you're at the beginning of your career or you may not be into your career yet, not a lot of savings. You don't have that um, savings to fall back on and be able to afford that. Not only that, but it's going to disrupt your career or your school. And so you have to take time off. And so supporting yourself can be really difficult. Um, so the financial toxicity in this group is enormous. Um, and then another big concern is fertility preservation. So for many, I mean, cancer treatment is going to affect fertility and their options. Um, <clears throat> and the patients are not always getting the information that they need. I know for me, when I was diagnosed, it was a pamphlet about your fertility kind of slid to the side and said, you're probably fine. Um, that's not an in-depth conversation that needs to be discussed on such a big deal for a lot of these patients where they are not old enough or not ready to talk about having a family, but they don't want that option closed off to them. So having, being able to have those conversations in the clinic is so important and so misunderstood, right? Like you said, 
doctors, oncology is focused on oncology and not on treatment. They don't know about fertility and preservation. They're not specialized in that. So being able to have that conversation is really important. And it's another reason why I tell patients to really go into the AYA clinics if they've got access to that or go to a specialist that understands those conversations because they're really, really important. Um, there's a lot of options coming out around fertility preservation, but um, if you're not a specialist, you're not going to know how to offer those, right? Um, and then two more concerns that I do really want to highlight. So the first is the emotional and social aspect of an adolescent and young adult diagnosis. So, you know, if you think about someone who's 15 or someone who's in their thirties or whatever, you're in a very transitional time of life, right? So um, especially for the younger ends, so 15 to into your twenties, um, you're just starting your career, you're going to school, you're doing all of these great things and life is changing and moving so fast. And a cancer diagnosis really disrupts all of that developmentally. Um, and for those on the older end, you might be a new family and just starting your family or have young kids at home um, and can really disrupt the flow of all of that. And so many adolescents and young adults who are diagnosed with the cancer, of course, are going through treatment and doing all that, but they also are experiencing high rates of distress. Um, and so they, they experience a lot of isolation and just emotional issues. And so <clears throat> it's really important to understand how to support them in that way as well. Um, and then finally, uh, we've already kind of alluded to it, but survivorship care planning um, with this group is really important. So, um, you know, along with pediatrics, you know, we have so many more decades of life to live. And so it's really important uh, to have great long-term follow-up care with this group, especially with, um, you know, longer and longer we are living and we don't necessarily know all the long-term and late effects that might come down the road into our sixties and seventies and, and into our elderly years. So um, as a result of our treatments early on in life. So it's just important to have great long-term follow-up care with this group. So those are some of the main concerns that I see. Um, I know there are many more, but those are the big ones, in my opinion. You you mentioned uh, live longer. Uh, as a clinician, a psychologist or psych oncologist, uh, we have one mission uh, to just to uh, let the patient know that there is time. That's the most important one. And the second one is to provide hope. So as we are special, specialists, we have to give hope and to express the, the idea that there is time. Because uh, after the cancer diagnosis, you know, the first emotion is fear and it's fear that uh, I, I don't have time. So yeah. uh, you, you mentioned uh, these uh, categories uh, before and uh, I, I have to ask you this. Uh, you do a lot of communication work, more or less, being an advocate for patients. So with whom it's, uh, let's say, harder to communicate? With patients, with caregivers, or with the other part? I mean, medical team, uh, or uh, I don't know, uh, insurance companies, or uh, uh, with with whom it's uh, harder to to communicate? Yeah, I think it depends too on right where we're sitting at in this 15 to 39 range, because yes, we're all lumped into this AYA category, but a 15 year old and a 39 year old are in very different parts mm -hmm. of life. So I'd say for the teens um, and early 20s, it can be very difficult to communicate with your medical team because you don't know what to ask. You don't know what your needs are. You are still figuring yourself out as a human and as an emerging adult. And um, you you are having a hard time navigating through this. You're relying on your parents a lot. I think it's also incredibly difficult sometimes to communicate with your loved ones, um, no matter the age in this age range, because it is such a jarring experience. I know for me, communicating with my parents was probably 
the hardest and often sometimes the easiest <laughs> because they're my parents and and they love me no matter what I say. But it was also so hard to be incredibly vulnerable and, and tell them what my needs were. Um, it, it's it's difficult. It's all so difficult. Um, and then as you're progress through this age range, communicating with your loved one, with your partner, um, with your children, your young children is incredibly hard task um to find the words that are needed uh to communicate through this it's yeah it's it's a challenging time yeah uh you mentioned challenging time we are uh, living in an era of digital interventions of a lot of e-health and uh, electronic uh, devices and so on and uh, of course we can't uh, ignore artificial intelligence so in this context, uh, how do you see the future of survivorship care with focus to Aya? Yeah, I find it incredible. It'll be very interesting to see how artificial intelligence continues to play a role. I've seen a few interesting studies. Um, one that I'd like to point out is uh, Dr. Zhang from University of Michigan. He had a really interesting study analyzing the use of technology um, when it comes to psychosocial outcomes of adolescents and young adults. So it was really an app that was able to be there for patients whenever they needed. Um, and kind of like a chat of how things are going and it's just someone to talk to essentially um, while they're in a moment of crisis or need some support. And it had really promising results. They actually found that adolescents and young adults utilize the um, chat feature uh, kind of in those wee hours of the morning when they're up in the middle of the night and they aren't able to sleep and they're thinking about all of the things and um, have no one to talk to. They're not going to wake someone up to, <laughs> to talk to them, but at 2, 3 a.m. when they really need that help, the app was there to be able to help them su help support them psychosocially. So I'm really fascinated about where that's going to go um, and just as we continue to get e-health and all of that. I'm also really interested in the use of wearables um, and technology in, in health implications across the spectrum. So not just in the cancer world, but in, in health in general. It's uh, really taken off in many years, but as things like the aura ring or things like that continue to to become popular, I'm, I'm fascinated to see if we'll be able to catch things earlier. Um, so technology is exciting, um, a little scary at times with how fast AI seems to be developing, but I think it can have really beautiful implications in addressing some of the needs for AYAs. So excited to see where the future of that goes. Yes, and uh, to to end, uh, let's say the, the interview in uh... A positive note, uh, young adolescents and young adults, they should take the information from reliable sources. I, I uh, with every occasion, I mention this because nowadays, uh, and especially in this category of adolescents, there are a lot of misinformation about cancer diagnosis process care. So, with this occasion also, uh, I uh, raise awareness that they should uh, take information from reliable sources. Do not be ashamed or ashamed to talk with parents, with friends, to ask for help, but just to be correctly informed. Yes, please. I please seek reliable sources for your information. I know a lot of people in this age range get their information from social media. Make sure it is a reliable source that you are getting your information for. I agree wholeheartedly. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Lauren, thank you very much for uh, joining uh, this episode of my interview series. It was very interesting to approach this vulnerable category with so much uh, things that they have to prove to themselves, to life, but also with uh, so much challenges, maybe yeah. too much challenges for uh, their age. This is my opinion. This is a category that have to face too much struggle for, for their age. Thank you, 
good luck uh, in your activity and uh, we, we need people involved. This is the most important uh, aspect of um, psychosocio-oncology to have people uh, who can make a difference within communities, within cancer communities, because it's not easy. Times are changing, technologies are evolving, so we have to, to, to be there, to be yeah. on the same uh, page as they say. Thank you very much and uh, good luck. Thank you so much for having me. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to Onka Daily on YouTube. Hit the bell icon to stay updated.